Good afternoon. My name is Anna Khan, and I'm an investor at Bessemer Venture Partners, where I help source and lead investments in cloud technology. And just a little bit of context, if, if you haven't heard of us, we're a $1.6 billion fund. Uh, we've been around for more than 100 years, probably the oldest venture capital firm in the United States. Um, and, and we invest all across the spectrum, so anywhere from $50,000 all the way up to $50 million. But we usually take a minority stake in growth companies. So you know, usually not majority uh, stakes. And over the course of 15 years, you know, it's only really been 15 years where we've invested in cloud uh, software. Um, we've invested in more than 100 plus cloud companies. So we probably have the biggest cloud portfolio in the US. Uh, and some of the companies you may be familiar with that we've invested in include Eloqua, Box, SendGrid, uh, Twilio, and LinkedIn. Um, so I only have 10 minutes, but I want to give you sort of a window into how Bessemer uh, thinks about cloud investing. And, and we'll cover a, a, a few segments here. Um, the first sort of very scary picture that comes to mind when you think about cloud investing in the last year uh, is this moment in February 2016. And I'm not sure if any of you remember this, but this is when the cloud index also known as all the public cloud companies at one given moment, um, fell 30% in a day. Uh, so cloud investors were, were very worried when we saw this. And, and, and why did this happen? The, the primary driver, because LinkedIn was such a large uh, percentage of the cloud index, was LinkedIn missed its earnings in February. Uh, it was sort of a 40 uh, percent earnings miss. They lost $11 billion in value in a day, and the cloud index shifted uh, a whole lot because of that. But it was also because Wall Street was getting smarter. Tech companies in Silicon Valley could no longer get away with growth against all odds. And this was a good reminder that we can't do that anymore, and it was a good reminder for investors. Um, luckily, by the second half of the year, uh, this index sort of rebounded, and it was back to sort of normal levels and really at par with the NASDAQ, the S&P, and Dow. Um, but, but it would be incorrect to say that the dip in public markets hadn't spooked us. It spooked investors, and it spooked cloud CEOs, private cloud CEOs, who were thinking about going public. Um, and, and, and so this had a number of outcomes. The, the, the biggest outcome was we had the fewest tech IPOs in 2016 since the financial crisis. And many people forget this. Um, so, so looking at, at that sort of blue bar graph, if you're a private cloud CEO, you don't want to go public, because Wall Street's going to sort of you know, not be very nice. Um, but, but, but there was an upside to this. So, so what was the upside? The upside was that in 2016, we saw four times as much M&A than any other year. Um, a lot of that was driven by the LinkedIn, my, the Microsoft acquisition of LinkedIn. Uh, but what it also showed was there is still public appetite for mergers and acquisitions. And it was primarily because revenue multiples for public cloud companies were at an all-time low. So large public companies thought, oh, why do I have to bother with acquiring private cloud companies when public cloud companies are at an all-time low? Um, and, and, and what it showed us was, OK, so if you take the total uh, sort of public cloud company market cap over the last few years, it's a $300 billion of market cap value. And this is very surprising. In that time frame, 40% of the cloud market cap has been acquired. So when people tell you, oh, it's a bad IPO environment, oh, it's a bad acquisition environment, that's actually not true. And the facts tell us something completely different. And, and what this tells us at Bessemer is that there's still enormous appetite for cloud innovation by acquirers at the public level. And there's some amazing private companies that are potentially slated for the public markets and have grown into their valuations over time. And Dropbox, for example, is a great, uh, is a great example because it just recently announced that it had reached a $1 billion revenue run rate. And so if you take nothing from this talk, think of this image. The tree is sort of what you see in the public markets. It's you know, almost $300, $300 billion of market cap 
um, just sort of in the public markets. But what people don't realize is that there are thousands of private cloud companies that are worth more than $100 billion of value that are slated to go public. And, and this just sort of gives you an example that there's a huge backlog of private companies um, that are slated to go public. Examples that have already done so, Cloudera, MuleSoft, and there's some great Bessemer companies up here that are also slated to go public uh, in the next few years or months. This is a slightly outdated uh, slide deck. Um, and, and then, you know, at Bessemer, when we choose companies to invest in, we want to look at their growth through the lens of efficiency. So this goes back to that first graph that I showed you. And what, what, what does that graph say? That says we can't get away with growth against all odds. So at Bessemer, every single company that pitches to us, we like to look at it from the lens of efficiency, not just growth. Um, and, and so we always look to the efficiency score. A lot of you are familiar with the rule of 40. People say, before you IPO, make sure that you're marginally around 40. What does that mean? That if you take your percent annual revenue growth and add it to your percent profit margin, make sure you're around 40. Well, what we like to look at is not revenue, but annual recurring revenue, and then not necessarily percent profit margin, but burn, because younger companies like to look at sort of free cash flow margin because you know, EBITDA is, is, is a lot harder at that scale. So every company that comes through Bessemer doors, internally we give it a score of, um, we, we sort of go through this equation. And what I want to convey is there's no sort of right way to do this. I want to give you two examples of two amazing public companies. Viva was not a Bessemer company, but Shopify was. And so look at what they over-indexed for. Shopify optimized always for revenue growth. It had 112% revenue growth in 2013 and a negative 4% burn or free cash flow margin. So it, it, it gave itself 108% power score. That is phenomenal for a company in the public market. Viva wasn't growing as fast as Shopify. And, and, and that's expected. You know, Viva sells to Pharma, Shopify sells to SMB. You sort of expect that. But it didn't uh, sort of sacrifice its power score for that result. It actually over-indexed on burn. And so when you think about your company, whether you're a private CEO or a public CEO, you don't have to go the growth route if there are sort of tailwinds in your market that don't allow that. You can go the sort of strong profit margin route. But always keep in mind the efficiency score because it's not just about 200%, 300% growth anymore. Um, and then what we realized through our research was you, can, you know, having one score throughout your life cycle is not going to fly anymore. And, and we actually calculated sort of all the companies that we had invested in and looked at public market data and realized that the best companies actually sort of followed this trend. So approximately three years before your IPO, you should have a really strong efficiency score. So forget about rule of 40. You should be much closer to 70%. So a great public company today, Twilio, was, was roughly in that area three years before its IPO. And closer to the IPO level, then that rule of 40 that you guys have all heard about starts to make sense. Um, and then, you know, two, three years, you can get closer to 30. But if you're a young company, three years out, you should be much higher in the efficiency score. And we've seen that that has a sort of direct correlation um, to your revenue multiple and market cap multiple in the public markets. Um, so this is sort of our efficiency rule. I'll, I'll, I'll go really quickly through it. And then, you know, part of the reason why I was invited here is you want to know how I think about data, how I think about investing, but you also want to think about what venture capitalists want to see private companies do today and how we think about the future. So I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to blaze through this. Um, but, but one of our first predictions was this is going to be the year of human-assisted AI. What does that mean? Sounds like kind of a fancy term. So AI, unfortunately, is sort of the new big data. Everyone in the Valley is talking about it. No one really understands it. We're sort of <laughs> waiting for the, net, you know, the best enterprise use case. But at Bessemer, we've realized over you know, a course of a few months of research that we're not going to find what I call perfect AI in the enterprise just yet. You're not going to see sort of service level humans be replaced with AI. It's just not good enough. What you'll see is human assisted AI. So let me give you a great example of that. Um, customer support. What we envision, and we've actually seen some technologies do this, is your customer support rep. You usually have to type in answers to someone at Samsung ask, asking you what a 50-inch TV costs. 
You have to go do that research each time. What we've seen some AI bots do is, based on the thousands and millions of conversations you've had in the past, here are three answers that we think you should input into your customer chat. But then the human has the ability to choose which three are perfect for that setting. And you'll start to see that in security, you'll see that in healthcare, and you'll see that in sales and marketing before AI totally takes over. So that's sort of our uh, first prediction. The second prediction, and one we talk about a lot because we were very early investors in Twilio, is that APIs will serve as the backbone of software infrastructure. And we think for developers and CEOs, that's a really powerful change. That means you don't have to worry about scale and infrastructure anymore, and you can worry about what your devs will call the fun stuff. That's your UI. That's how you know, your software looks and feels. And then all these other really crucial elements are basically taken care of by other companies. A great example is Stripe for payments. You know, Shopify, which is you know, a great sort of retail POS system, all its payments are powered by Shopify. It gets to worry about, it, it gets to have the luxury of worrying about other stuff. Twilio, you know, Uber and WhatsApp, whenever you get a text message, um, it's all powered by Twilio. So Uber can focus on other elements of their product. So always keep that in mind and realize that you, if you're a developer, you're really lucky to be in this sort of decade in the last five years. Um, this one people don't really talk about and we think it's really important. Everyone says, move to the cloud, it's the future. And, and we agree with that, but I've personally, with a lot of my private companies, seen when they get at scale, cloud infrastructure is their number one cost item. And then they can't get around it. And so if you are a company that is growing fast, you're on AWS, you're on Azure, just make sure that you're architecting for success. Make sure that you're optimizing public and private before these costs run away from you. Because when you're one year from, from IPO, my time's up, I'll be very quick. Um, it's, it's very hard to do so, and your investors won't like it, and Wall Street won't like it. Um, this is another interesting one. You know, everyone here, if you're a CEO, you know your NPS score by heart. It's all about what do customers think about your product. But what I don't think you can answer is how are your employees feeling? Uh, are, are, are your managers managing well? And so what I want you to get away from this slide is make sure you NPS everything in your organization. Um, and so what that means for investing is we look for software that helps you measure sort of the pulse of your employees better. And there's real data that proves that we have to do this now. Millennials are a majority of our labor workforce. They're the number one segment today, and they care about the soft stuff. They care about how their managers treat them. They care about their performance reviews. Um, and so you know, invest in better performance review software. Invest in augmented writing platforms. Write better job descriptions because it matters. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I have two more. Screenless software, you know, you, Tobias, you covered this a little bit, but we've seen screens become medium screens, tiny screens, and this year we think screens will altogether disappear. And so voice is the future. You should be building for voice. And this is a really, we'll skip this, this is a really interesting stat that Sundar, the CEO of Google, mentioned. 20% of queries on the Google mobile app and Android dev devices today are voice searches. So, you know, consumers are already there. So if you're not thinking about voice, especially with incredible platforms like Alexa, um, you're behind. And then lastly, something that I'm very passionate about, especially because there's a lack of female VCs, there's a lack of female founders, is that this is not a PR ploy anymore. There is real hard evidence that says that diverse teams win and that having more women in your organizations and having more uh, sort of ethnic diversity in your organization can actually influence the bottom line. So I would encourage you all to keep that in mind as you expand your organizations. Uh, and I would personally love to see more female founders in the cloud ecosystem. Sorry for going over, but, but thank you.